Hi, I'm Connor Friedersdorp, a staff writer at The Atlantic Magazine. And I'm James Polis, a contributor at Forbes and a columnist for The Daily Caller. You're going to have to forgive me if I cough throughout our dialogue. I have a little bit of allergies going here, uh, but hopefully we will get through it without me losing a lung. And uh, let's start by talking about the most radical social experiment in American history. Um, I wrote a column recently trying to figure out what exactly that is. I uh, was riffing off of something that Dennis Prager wrote, and he was making the argument that gay marriage is the most radical experiment in modern history, as he put it. And I got to thinking, you know, he and I disagree about whether gay marriage is a good idea. Uh, but, but beyond that, I thought that actually there are a lot of really radical social experiments in American history that are kind of interesting to think about. Um, you know, the American founding is one of them, and I listed a bunch more, um, you know, pioneering culture and its institutionalization in the Homestead Act and the Great Migration and eugenics and forced sterilization programs and women's suffrage and prohibition and the GI Bill, um, the spread of railroads and uh, legalized abortion and the birth control pill and no-fault divorce, uh, all these different things. And so uh, I, I'm curious, what do you think when you, when you look back at, uh, at American history, what do you think is the most radical thing that we've done as a social experiment? Well, I don't think it's gay marriage. Um, it, you know, it, it's possible that, that, uh, that a federal government which would recognize gay marriage and, and a variety of other kinds of marriages as all being sort of officially equal, maybe mm -hmm. that's, that's radical, but you know, that's, that's a topic for another day. Um, I, what, I, I would say that the most radical social experiment in all of history would be race-based slavery, actually. Mm -hmm. um, very modern thing to do back in ancient times. Uh, slavery was a lot different. Uh, you lost a battle, you became a slave, you, you won a battle, or you sort of killed your captors, and then you were free again, and, and you could kind of go back and forth between being in servitude and, and being out of servitude without carrying any kind of permanent marker or identifier um, of, your, of your prior condition of servitude. Uh, right. That changed when, when race-based slavery came along, and it had a, a <coughs> profoundly damaging effect on, um, on people wherever they were to be found, wherever that institution was in place. Uh, so when I look at what the United States of America has had to go through in terms of recovering from institutionalized race-based slavery, um, it's a process that's still not over. I don't know what it's going to take for it ever to end. Um, and then to see sort of other narratives of social change or other narratives of progress um, getting mapped back onto that experience, uh, which in some ways, yeah, if you look at it politically, um, there's questions of justice. We all have sort of concerns about justice and, and what justice is and what politics can do to make things just. On the other hand, uh, there really is something unique about race-based uh, slavery, right. I think. And, and there's, there's a way in which other... <coughs> struggles for rights or rights claims, uh, I think, don't map as well onto those that emanated out of, out of our experience with race-based slavery as, as some people might like. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that to, to try to preemptively undermine other rights claims. I mean, people have them, right, they yeah. can feel them, that's fine. Um, but, but I do think that there's, there's something radical about saying that human beings aren't uh, of one species kind. Um, they're actually more like different species, uh, with some being inferior to others. Um, right. Yeah. In, in the blood, and then trying to implement that, so to trying to, to encode that into the law, into the culture, into politics. That's a pretty radical experiment, and I think we can count right. it as a failure. But, and and interestingly, um, colorblindness itself, um, one of the one of the things that has evolved as a way to respond to our history of, uh, of slavery. Colorblindness is itself radical, right? To, to say that we're going to look past race and that we're going to treat everyone equally and that we're going to try to go about our lives and try to structure our society in a way that we don't prejudge people based on this physical difference that has been caused for uh, prejudging and discrimination in so many societies throughout history. Uh, I think one interesting thing about uh, about this whole subject there's there's really no way uh, there's really no way to go about it in a way that isn't uh, unprecedented unless you that is a radical social experiment unless you want to live with some terribly ugly consequences um, and I, I think that uh, it, it's interesting in that way it, it's an example of how 
radical social experiments uh, can, can be among the worst things or, or the most ennobling uh, that, that we've seen in, in American history. Um, I, I think uh, when I was going through the list uh, that I made at the Atlantic, I was also struck by how many of these things are technology driven and they're social experiments in the sense that they are happening on a large scale and changing the way that we act as a society. Um, but th there's really no choice about a lot of them. There's really, um, you know, once TV was invented, there were changes that could be made at the margins. Uh, but it's pretty incredible to think that now we live in a society where people sit in front of a, uh, a little frame watching moving pictures for you know, four, five hours uh, a day for the average American. It's a radically different thing than before TV, right? And you can just go down the list um, and find all of these things that, you know, some things like the all-volunteer army, uh, we have a choice about that. That's, uh, we, could, we could go back to the old system uh, tomorrow. We, we could keep it the way that it is. And, uh, and yet a lot of things, the rise of the Internet being the latest one, we just don't have very many policy choices. And I would argue that something like the rise of the Internet is going to change society in much more radical ways than just about anything that we could realistically legislate. That, that is, that we could get past a, a legislature with people's um, preference for not, not having radical changes be legislated. That, that strikes me as being correct. Uh, these technological changes, whether it's the birth control pill or the internet or cars, the cars have made a colossal impact on the way human beings live their lives, on the way labor is divided, on sort of male-female relationships. Uh, it's had a huge impact. Um, but it wasn't a social experiment. Um, of course, there were some people who decided, you know, I'm going to dedicate my life to, to building cars, or I'm going to dedicate my life to glamorizing cars. Uh, but when you look at these big sort of macro-level technological changes, uh, they're not really social experiments. I, I don't think it makes sense to think of them in that way. Um, and, and I think the 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 point of, of what you're saying that really resonates uh, is that the really big changes don't come as a result of deliberate action or top-down policymaking, planning. Uh, the really big changes that endure and, and transform uh, societies are, are changes that, um, that happen in a kind of snowball effect. A uh, combination of factors um, leading people to start treating each other differently or interacting differently. Um, and then, you know, it's, it might be a, a little bit you know, tacky at this point to say, and then it spreads virally. Um, but it kind of does. Um, and that's why the change is so powerful, and, and that's why I think it's so long lasting. Yeah, I, 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 and I want to actually dig a little bit deeper here because you're right in the sense that. You know, the automobile didn't arise as a social experiment. It wasn't as if someone drew this up in a, you know, a, a sociology seminar and then and then pushed it out to the masses. At, at the same time, if you're whether you're talking about a technology like the automobile or like the internet, uh, th these do become social experiments uh, in a way very quickly, right? I mean, um, the internet's maybe an, an easier example to make. So, think about how in the early days. Of the internet, you know, this was a government-sponsored uh, thing before it came into being, and w w when it spread to public use, there was pretty early on this idea that oh, this is a useful technology, and we want to push it out to the masses, right? Um, you hear talk of the digital divide, how some people are going to get left behind by the internet revolution. Uh, you hear about the need to get the internet into classrooms and to get computers, for that matter, into classrooms and to uh, make everyone conversant in this technology. And sometimes it can be hard to tease out how much this is a matter of recognizing something that is going to become ubiquitous and uh, trying to make everyone conversant in it through the social experiment of education, or, or on the other hand, pushing it in directions um, th that it might not necessarily go otherwise. And uh, you know, maybe it's too early to, to tell where the internet would have gone or we're too close to it to speculate about it. Certainly you can think of instances where the automobile spread in ways that it might not have because people went in and tore up streetcar lines, right? Uh, because we built a uh, interstate highway system. Um, so I think it's really hard to tease apart 
where technological change and social experiment, uh, uh, where the divide is exactly. It is hard, and, and maybe the upshot of that is uh, is to think about the changes that have appeared over time in our social lives and in, in cultural life as a result of people performing radical experiments on themselves, uh, and, and then the consequence that that has for for the rest of us, uh, rather than people who sort of go into things thinking I'm going to perform a, a, a radical experiment on on society, uh, or people who think well you know perhaps society can perform a radical experiment on itself. Uh, yeah, maybe, um, and and there are little movements that come and go over time, and historically, sometimes they they amount to something, sometimes they don't amount to much. Uh, but even just going back to you know early Christianity and, and the colossal impact that the, that the real spread of Christianity had on on human life on Earth and on, on societies of multiple continents right up to the present day. Um, in many cases, what was going on there, I think, was individuals were deciding that they were going to radically transform themselves mm -hmm. uh, and and weren't thinking much past that. Um, that can be a really powerful thing when you get a, a, a critical mass of people who are thinking that way about themselves and about their own lives. Um, then I think you get a powerful kind of change that just isn't going to be uh, captured or even comprehended um, by even very smart and well-meaning people in, in fields like law and policy and politics. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's one of my... One of my favorite tensions in you know reading someone like Hayek is his simultaneous notion that one, you know, he, he's very conservative in many ways. He thinks that um, trial and error has produced these bits of received wisdom that have been handed down that we don't entirely understand in policy and culture, and that we ought to err on the side of uh, of trusting those of, of maintaining the status quo and of. Um, of taking advantage of these bits of wisdom that we don't entirely understand. Uh, and he, he, in fact, goes so far as to advocate taboos at times. You know, it, it's it's good that we have some received wisdom that becomes custom, and it's good that we have other things that don't work that become taboo. Uh, and, and yet he's insistent, unlike a lot of conservatives, uh, in the idea that we preserve the ability for individuals to break taboos. We preserve the ability for individuals uh, to go radically against custom at times um, be, because that's how we progress, he, he would say. And I, I agree with that. I, I actually should briefly plug uh, Jim Manzi's new book, Uncontrolled, which delves into this a bunch and, and tries to figure out how to apply some of these insights and some others that he has to uh, policy making. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, I think that you're right that individuals um, seeking radical change on their own often do have the most powerful impact. Uh, and perhaps it's so unpredictable uh, to, to know when that's going to happen. And that's why we don't see, we don't see people trying to affect change at, at the political level that way very much. So there are a couple things going on here. I think that we can sometimes fall into the habit of conflating ideas like custom and taboo and ideas of the sacred. I'd kind of separate them all out. Um, so custom, you, you get these habits that accrue over time. People get used to doing them. Uh, if they don't like talking about it, it's because maybe it's too complicated to talk about. You know, it's like when you have a little kid and they keep asking why, and you keep giving them answers, and they keep asking why. There's a reticence about that that I think is, is different from, although sometimes mixed up with, uh, reticence about things like, well, this is sacred, so it's not to be spoken of. Um, there's a profanation involved in in making explicit what people think is implicit or in even just talking about that which shouldn't be done. Um, and cultures can have very complex ways of, of dealing with the gray area where there are things that aren't supposed to be done except in certain circumstances and even then, you know, perhaps we don't really talk about them. Um, and those two things are then in turn different, I would say, from, from taboos where if you look at pre-biblical culture especially, uh, where, take ancient Greece for example, uh, where faith plays a role um, that in, in later eras, um, after biblical civilization spreads, um, is, mm -hmm. is sort of swept away and replaced with faith. Um, and when you have a, a taboo culture, I, I would say what you have is, is a culture where there are certain objects or practices that are invested with this kind of mystical, inexplicable meaning. Uh, so whereas when you're in a culture where certain objects are sacred, 
um, they're invested with meaning that might be supernatural or transcendent in some way, uh, but it's mm -hmm. a very identifiable meaning. Um, it's it's not uh, it's it's not the kind of meaning that you get when you don't have, say, a, a monotheistic religion um, in place. So as conservatives try to sort through um, what it is that you're talking about with Hayek and and just in in general, whether it's gay marriage or other things, and, and conservatives are taking a moment where they're trying to assess why it is that they that they think the way they do and how it cashes out in a policy sense. Um, I think my caution for them would be uh, don't try to you know scramble all three of these things sort of conservative custom uh, sense of the sacred um, and then this kind of uh, uh, primitive or, or ancient uh, vision of, of the taboo uh, a lot of different things going on there and um, as we try to sort out how to talk about things that make us uncomfortable uh, how to talk about things that we think are disgusting uh, what role perceptions of disgust play in how we shape public policy um, it's really going to help to be a little bit more clear-eyed about where the commitments are coming from, uh, where the reticence is coming from, um, and I, I think conservatives are going to find themselves actually perhaps disagreeing more often than agreeing in certain instances uh, when it turns mm -hmm. out that, say, conservative A is really troubled by a practice, whether it's gay marriage or something else, uh, because it offends their sense of the sacred, um, rather than a conservative who's saying, well, you know, I don't have that problem. But I am concerned that the tempo of change is too fast, and if it's coming from the top down, then that's going to have negative effects, not only for the way that our culture works, but for the way that our politics works, too. Right. Huh. Um, why don't we move on to the next topic? And you wanted to discuss Europe, uh, which is much in the news with uh, predictions about whether the euro is going to survive or not survive, and whether the continent uh, and the various countries suffering from financial collapse should be going about austerity or Keynesian stimulus or some uh, third option, maybe the Germans just handing out money to everyone. Um, what do you think? Give us your overview of uh, what is going on in Europe now that we should be paying attention to and what are your thoughts about it? Uh, my overview is that Europe suffers from a profound crisis of political authority. There's no overarching institution in Europe that commands real political authority. <clears throat> uh, the EU doesn't do it. Um, it's a bureaucratic organization. Um, it's a regulatory organization. Um, it, it, you know, it might have a flag, uh, but the flag just has some stars on it and it doesn't, um, doesn't really stand for anything politically. Um, <clears throat> the Euro can't muster political authority. It's just a currency. Um, and, and, uh, and there's no, people are looking for the, well, Europeans just need to capture their, their sense of togetherness. Um, it's not going to happen unless they have a political authority to oversee things. Um, and that's important because <clears throat> across the political spectrum right now, uh, very smart people on the left, on the right, uh, somewhere in the, the mushy middle, are holding out this hope, and this is a very elite thing to do, um, they're holding out this hope that there really is an economic answer to, to the problem of Europe. Uh, whether it's uh, a guy like Niall Ferguson saying, oh, if only those industrious Germans would just realize that, um, <clears throat> that if they decide that they can rule Europe economically and, and save Europe, uh, then they can. Um, or whether it's Paul Krugman saying, well, you know, if, if only the ECB or, or some coalition of the willing would assemble the right kind of package um, and and create growth, meaning really you know growth in government um, and jobs created mm -hmm. by governments, um, <coughs> and not worry so much about uh, inflation. Well, then Europe could be saved. Um, mm -hmm. No economic measure is going to work in Europe if it doesn't have uh, pan-European political legitimacy, and <clears throat> that kind of legitimacy doesn't come from a balance sheet. It doesn't come from getting the economic theory right. It doesn't come from invoking, uh, invoking the right kind of, uh, of fiscal practices. Um, <clears throat> it comes from something more primal than that, and it, it comes from something much more political. Uh, so when I look at a country like Greece, which is right now being pulled apart um, by far-right parties and far-left parties, um, and voters who have taken a look at the center-left and the center-right and said no to it, um, when I see things like this starting to happen, <clears throat> even in France, uh, where Sarkozy's center-right government was thrown out because people were basically just over it. Um, they, they didn't like it anymore. 
Um, and so the next, you know, the next guy in line who could get the most votes was Francois Hollande. He got the job. Um, but he's, you know, he's, his, his center leftism, even though he's a socialist, he's kind of a, a weak need socialist. Um, and, and socialism isn't practical in this political climate anyway. So it's going to be half socialism, uh, which might fail half as much or fail twice as much, uh, depending on what happens in the rest of Europe. When I look at Greece and when I look at France, um, what I see here, our political conditions are starting to develop where no single economic answer that, that can apply to all of Europe is going to be palatable. Um, to large numbers of, of Europeans, um, and that's going to create problems in parliamentary countries where you need to form governing coalition. If you can't form a governing coalition, what's going to happen is what's happening in Greece right now, which is, oh, we have to hold elections again next month. The outcome will probably be the same. Um, the solution isn't going well, to be one let that me, be let dropped me, from the top-down economically. Now, let me press you a little bit on this, because there's a sense in which the European experiment since the end of uh, the Second World War has been a tremendous success, right? We've gone from a, a continent that was divided by the Iron Curtain to one that is substantially more free now uh, th than it was for, for many decades. Uh, the continent that was, you know, warring with each other in these increasingly horrific uh, you know, spasms of, of violence that uh, there's no European country right now that is inclined to start a massive war with its neighbors for territorial gain. Um, d despite the, the possible failure of the euro, th there is still a, a relatively uh, robust framework of economic, uh, of free trade and cooperation among the euro countries, that, and it served its political purpose, which is to say um, the prosperity of the neighboring countries uh, it is at least important enough to a country that uh, it's in no one's economic interest to go to war with one another. And so it, it seems to me, given, given where Europe came from, uh, this has in large part been successful. And if, if, if we define success that way, if we define success as, you know, no intra-European wars and an ability to be militarily powerful enough at least to repel invasions from foreign aggressors, uh, you know, the Europeans right now aren't worried about Soviet expansion uh, back into the Western Bloc or even further into the Eastern Bloc. Why does Europe need to be any more unified than that? Why isn't that sufficient? And, uh, and, and once you have that level of basic political stability and lack of incentive for war, why isn't it enough for the Spaniards to go on living as Spaniards and the French to go on living as, uh, as French men and women and, uh, and, and all of the rest? Well, I think that's a, a question that I'd like to hear more Europeans address because it's the answer has gone kind of implicit all this time. Um, nationalism is still a problem. Uh, for starters, I think I'd say that you know countries tend not to go to war because it's in their economic interest to do so. Uh, the world was at historic highs in terms of globalization um, on the eve of World War One. That didn't stop the war from happening. Uh, the United States didn't invade Iraq because it was in our economic interest to do so. Not really. There were some people who said, well, if we do this, then we'll get all the oil, that would be great. Uh, but that's not why we ended up there. That's not what motivated public opinion to get us there. Um, and that's certainly not the way the war was fought. Um, when you look at Europe and you say, yeah, there's an economic interest here. Um, it's, and this was, uh, there. I think it was in Der Spiegel, um, where uh, uh, German documents were finally pried out of the hands of the government. Um, through their version of a FOIA request, I think. And, um, and what was divulged in these documents is that the, the Germany deliberately sold the euro uh, to Europe as something of a, a peacemaking function. Um, and countries like Italy were brought into the eurozone, despite the fact that, that the economists in, in Germany and elsewhere knew uh, that the claims they were making about their fiscal soundness um, and their appropriateness for meeting euro criteria um, were more or less fabricated. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, there, there was definitely a, a, a clear sense in which the euro was constructed, the eurozone was constructed, uh, and, and, the, and the EU was constructed um, as a, a series of institutions designed to give European countries economic reasons for peace so powerful that they then wouldn't go to war. On the other hand, um, that process has allowed a certain kind of nationalism to remain very much in place. 
uh, and I think it's a tremendously pernicious one that's finally starting to catch up with Europe. Um, and it's, it's on track to plunge Europe back into the kind of dire straits that do historically um, uh, preface military conflict. Um, here's what I mean. And what kind of nationalism is that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, okay, so if you look at, um, let's just use Greece for another example, poor Greece, but, but it's instructive. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the size of the Greek government, when you look at the size of the civil service, when you look at the um, social benefits that that government provides, uh, I think what you get a picture of is a country that is subsidizing its nationalism. Um, Spain is another example. When basically, if you're you know if you're under the age of thirty, the only job that you can get is working for the government. Um, something is wrong here, and it's not just wrong in an ideological sense of like, well, this is making the state bigger. Sure, that's true. Uh, but I think the the root problem. Why is that happening? It's because these governments in these European countries want the nation to persist. Um, you can't have a government of Spain that can spend all this money and continue to hire all these people and extend these patronage networks and uh, uh, increase corruption and, and bribery and, and grease those wheels. You can't do that in, uh, if there isn't a Spain. Um, you can't do that in Athens unless there's a Greece. Um, in the absence of that kind of government, um, in the presence of an open labor market in Europe, for instance, uh, what you will get are massive mm -hmm. population transfers. Um, and not until you start getting population transfers on that scale, where you get uh, unemployed young Spaniards um, saying, uh, we're all going to go somewhere else to get a job. Um, and when you get large numbers of, you know, whether they're Germans or <coughs> British pensioners or whomever saying, we're all going to leave because, you know what, retiring in Manchester is a horrible idea. I'm going to buy a train ticket, saved up some money, and I'm going to go, you know, to... Uh, to the Mediterranean, until you start getting tides of Europeans moving back and forth because they've been emancipated from their own little sort of national geographical area, um, then I think what you're going to get is more of this kind of uh, 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 nationalism that is being bankrolled with debt and is a luxury that, that European governments can't afford anymore. Hmm. I'm, not sure I, I, I'm not sure I entirely understand um understand your argument that w what Spain says is bankrolling is nationalism. Um, to, to me, to, to me, it, it's going to be a tremendous challenge for European countries when there's a huge influx of Poles somewhere and, you know, the locals, wherever that is, are concerned that they're going to lose jobs that they traditionally held to people from another country who are, you know, legally permitted to work there, uh, but who are ethnically different, who are culturally different, who maybe don't have the same uh, expectations as the wealthier Western European countries about the kinds of hours that they're going to work or the kind of retirement deal they're going to get. Um, I, I, I certainly appreciate the challenge that that that, uh, <laughs> that, that represents and also the possibility that a couple generations down the line, it could in fact strengthen the European community to have, you know, labor market mobility and to take advantage of some of the gains from trade that that represents. Uh, I, but but where I'm losing you is I, I don't see why the status quo welfare state in uh, in Spain, say, or in Germany for that matter, or England or, or wherever, uh, it, it doesn't seem so different to me. Uh, you know, obviously the various countries have different welfare states, but the uh, it, it, it seems like losing national unity and, you know, if you were to somehow go to a system entirely run at the EU level, right, uh, wouldn't there still be a welfare state that was financed uh, under the broad understanding of the social compact that prevails in Europe? Well, there might be something like it, and again, if it's if it's the EU and not nations, the EU still isn't a, a political entity, really. So people aren't going to be able to people aren't going to be willing to swallow that. Is this is the problem that Germany is experiencing right now? Uh, why can't Germany rule Europe economically? It's because no one accepts the political authority of Germany. Nobody does that in Europe. They don't want to, so it's not going to work. Um, 
why is it that you know that the, the French have their their quote unquote way of life and they trust entrust the preservation of that way of life to their government? Um, I'm a bit of a squish on the French, so I, you know I'm going to stick with the Mediterranean countries as, as examples because they dramatize the point so well. Um, why is government so large in these Mediterranean countries? Uh, why is it so large in Spain? Why is it so large in Greece? It's large because it's paying people to stay in Spain um, under conditions where otherwise they wouldn't. Um, either they wouldn't because they couldn't get a job or they wouldn't because uh, the economic uh, situation is unacceptable to them. Um, it's, it's, it's subsidizing a population um, to retain its national character. Um, that might be uh, quaint, um, and it, it might be. It, it might increase a sense of local solidarity, um, but it isn't working, uh, and, and neither the EU nor the eurozone has been able to do anything to stop these governments from subsidizing their national character um, by basically paying people uh, to to stay in the country, um, whether by giving them uh, social benefits that keep them there or by giving them government jobs, or by uh, roping them into this cycle of, uh, of bribery and corruption that is that is rampant down there. Um, it's a problem, and... and well, well, this, raises, this raises a larger question that, that you've been thinking about with regards to Germany, and that I think about a lot with regards to Spain, and that is, um, what sort of claim do people have on their culture as a legitimate thing to, uh, to, to preserve with, with state funding? Uh, you know, you have a country like Spain where the custom is to go home from work every day for three hours for siesta and to have a big meal at lunch and to take a long nap and then to go back to work and to stay there until 7 or 7.30 at night. And uh, it puts you on a different work schedule than the, the rest of the Eurozone. And there's been a lot of tension about this. You know, if you're working in an office in Barcelona or Madrid, maybe you don't take uh, siesta if you're with a multinational company. Uh, if you're working in an office in the south of Spain, if you're working in a domestic industry, uh, you, you probably do still take siesta. And, and this is a, you know, a defining element of Spanish culture. It's something that uh, maps on to how much time you spend with your family and the kind of, you know, the physical environment in which you live, whether the top spars in your neighborhood are able to stay open as they have for uh, decades and decades and decades. Um, it, 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 isn't that a legitimate thing for a people to decide uh, that this is something we, we want to preserve these aspects of our culture despite what the rest of the world is doing and we have decided as a people to spend money to do that? I, it's, it's a legitimate desire. Um, my question would be, how's that working for you? Uh, the answer is horribly. It's working horribly. Um, even 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 Germany. You know, Matt Iglesias had a post a, a couple of days ago um, where he said, you know, Germany wants um, structural reform in, in these other European countries. Uh, they could do some structural reform too themselves. Uh, they could, you know, they could get rid of the blue laws on Sundays that make it impossible to buy socks on a Sunday. Um, they could make sort of structural changes to their own uh, labor market. Um, that would uh, basically get women out of the house more often to buy stuff. Um, they can't <coughs> because they're not able to buy stuff. Uh, is that a fair <laughs> argument? Um, you know, I don't know. A, a, a cultural conservative would say, hey, wait a minute, this is these people's heritage, this is their custom. Um, it's, it's insane to think that they should have to uh, modernize things that they don't want to quote-unquote modernize um, uh, in order to, to sustain some economic arrangement that um, that has proven you know, fatally flawed in, in some way. So yeah, there is that. But on the other hand, um, Germany is still has still not uh, rid itself of the of, of, of its guilt for the Second World War. Uh, you've got Greeks in par in and out of Parliament saying that Germany needs to um, pay some more reparations because you know World War II. Um, that kind of blame isn't going to go away anytime soon. Uh, so whether it's Germany or Spain or Greece or Italy or France or any of these countries where there is this um, venerable kind of, of particular culture about work, um, yeah, it might be legitimate for, for the locals to feel like they want to continue their traditions. Um, but the question is, how's that working for them and how's it working for Europe? Uh, I don't see a, a, a path forward if people aren't willing to, to 
bend on those points. And again, if, if Europe was really united in some kind of political way, uh, then, then people would be more willing, I think, to accept a law that says, or, or, or a, a fiscal arrangement that, that works something like the Fed or something like our federal government, where you know there's going to be wealth redistribution on a geographic basis. There just is. Um, and even if you don't like that, you can grumble about it. You can try to vote in people who might change things at the margins, but in the meanwhile, you're going to do it. Um, let us move on to uh, American culture and a, a particular aspect of it. Uh, how old is Nikos now? So Nikos is my son. He's uh, two years old. He's going to be three uh, in a couple months. And so now that you've been at this for almost three years, I wanted to ask you, how is parenting different than you anticipated that it would be uh, before Nikos came along? Um, I anticipated that it would be easier which is probably um, which is probably a bit of a cliche. Um, so I will try to make it interesting by saying um, uh, I thought that I would have been better prepared uh, for parenting by my own experience as a kid. Um, I, I think that people who go into parenting thinking that they're good, they're prepared for it. Um, I typically feel that way because, well, I'm an adult now, or I've sort of read these books, or I've seen someone else raise children, um, <clears throat> and then shock, you know, you, you're actually not prepared, your kid is, um, is as much a stranger as someone that you would bump into onto the street, and now they're living in your house. Um, it's hard to be prepared for that, but the, <laughs> the shock for me was um, actually my experiences as a child growing up, um, just, you know, they, they didn't map very well onto what are already clearly Nikos' own Sort of personal experiences, given his personality and his character. Huh. Do you just mean that your personalities at the same age were very different, and and that means that you uh, perhaps benefit from different styles of parenting? Is that what you mean? Uh, yeah, you know, I was a kid, for instance, who um, who did not go to preschool. My first day of school was my first day of kindergarten. Um, <clears throat> and when I realized, sort of when I, I understood what was going on, that I was being dropped off and I was going to now be in this room with this, this bunch of people and I didn't know any of them or choose any of them, right? That was all very horrifying to me. And I, I ran back to the car and my right. dad had to sort of take me back and say, no, this is actually fine. You're going to love it. And, you know, I came right. around. Um, but I was not the kind of kid that was in a hurry to get out of the house when I was very young. Um, Nikos is almost completely different uh, from that. And if, you know, if eventually he, he goes back through the intertubes and watches this one day, he will probably say, no, you're projecting on me, just like you always do, Dad. <laughs> um, but, you know, he, he's in preschool. So there are instances he's, he's where... It, um, and it's, it's, it's fun and fascinating, but also like a constant head check um, to really realize that your child is a stranger in your house. Um, insofar as he's, he's, he's a person who you didn't really have any influence on other than some deep in the biology, um, shaping his personality. Right. Well, and that's fascinating because, uh, I, I guess you expect when you ask a parent, you know, what, what weren't you prepared for that the answer, uh, you know, you, you can imagine a lot of answers. One of the things uh, I wouldn't have imagined that you would have said is, I wasn't prepared for this instance when I thought I was going to have to be there in a support role as a father. Uh, but in fact, this thing that I thought would be really traumatizing actually wasn't at all. And, and I wasn't prepared f for not having to be there, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and it, the, it, it was easy for me to react in like a, oh, I'm hurt. You know, like... Uh, you're taking away an opportunity for me to be excellent <laughs> right. in a way that I want to I was going to be a really good dad today. You're taking that away from me. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, of course, that's insane. That's something a crazy person would think. And um, <clears throat> one of the sort of har harrowing but instructive things about parenting um, is, you know, I, I thought I was pretty, pretty much done puzzling through my personal issues or whatever. Um, before I had a child and then he comes along and suddenly, oh, <laughs> look, here are all these unresolved things about sort of who I am and, and why I am the way I am and, and what's been a choice that I've made about who I am and what's been sort of the consequence of, of stuff that I've interpreted or misinterpreted over time. 
Um, and having right. a kid, at least for me, and maybe this isn't other people's experience, maybe it is. Um, I suspect that it is for at least some people. Um, having a kid really calls some of that stuff into question and has caused me to, to have to wrestle on almost a daily basis with like, why am I behaving this way to my, toward my child? Um, am I doing this because I'm choosing right. to do it or am I doing it because I've somehow, you know, because I'm somehow proving out the biblical injunction that the sins will be visited on sort of the, the seventh generation of the sinner. Um, right. it, there is a lot of that going on. You know, if you don't want to talk about it in sin terms, it's fine. Um, but there is a lot of like moments of clarity where it's like, oh, I've inherited this behavior and it's so internal to me that I wasn't even conscious of, of what I was doing, which is a little scary when right. you're like supposedly an adult. And do you think, um, it, looking back on, on the gulf separating what you thought parenthood would be like and, uh, and, and, and what it has been like, do, do you think that, you know, we're confronted with a lot of images of parenting. We see it in TV. We see it in movies. We see, you know, people in the supermarket, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, do you think that this is something where you were... Uh, misled by the culture in some way, or do you think that there actually is no way to prepare for this? It's just that it's, <laughs> it's, an, it's, it's the experience that you can't really know what it is until you, uh, until you go through it. Hmm. I don't know if I'm prepared to answer that question. Um, I don't think I have the answer <clears throat> yet. And, uh, yeah. and ultimately I'm not sure that it matters, um, in terms of my sort of journey with my son as a father. Um, you know, even just a couple of years ago, I would have been much more conventional or, or conventionally conservative in how I would answer that question. Um, invoke, in, invoke Burke and, and, uh, you know, and, and society as a, as, as, um, being composed not only of the living, but of the unborn and the dead and, and all that good stuff. Um, but in reality, um, I think it's, it's not that surprising that you've got, a, a, a resurgence of, uh, of of social liberalism and social libertarianism and social conservatism seems to be um, seems to be taking its lumps and not being able to dish out all that many lumps. Um, both the libertarians and the liberals uh, basically accept the proposition that, to a, a fair extent, the world is going to raise your child. Um, that. Yeah, the family is is there, and that's fine. Um, and maybe even you know going to play an important role in, in your child's rearing. But really, reality is in the world, um, and the sooner that your child gets into it and becomes well adjusted to it, the better. You know, it, it is interesting now that I think about it that you most often associate homeschooling with. Uh, religious conservative parents as opposed to libertarian parents, right. uh, despite despite the fact that libertarians will be more likely to tell you, oh, the government should stand of everything, I want to do it all myself, I want to be self-sufficient, um, that, uh, that I guess the greater chasm between the values of religious conservatives and, and uh, secular culture, uh, ultimately, that's a more powerful driver of people to homeschooling. I guess that makes sense, but I never quite thought of it that way. Well, yeah, that's right. And, you know, 50 years ago, um, the prospect of more or less letting the world raise your child uh, would not be as, as daunting or as alien to as generically Christian person as it is today. Mm -hmm. um, so, I no, I'm, I'm not surprised that homeschooling has taken off um, among the, the devout. Uh, and, you know, my guess is that trend's going to continue and intensify. Um, over the, especially over the next you know, 10, 15 years. Right, and I suppose we're also in for more parenting manifestos. We've recently seen the Tiger Mom manifesto and the uh, French parenting is better than American parenting manifesto. I, think I, I don't think I read that manifesto, but I saw Peg writing about it at the American scene, and, uh, and it, 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 it's the one topic that in, in my experience on the web, is just guaranteed to elicit these very powerful, impassioned reactions, and and uh, it, it's 
it's fascinating to me to read, uh, you know, cultural histories that talk about, for example, I'm, I'm trying to think, I'm blanking on the name of the famous child rearing book that was kind of widely, widely accepted in the, I think in the 1950s. Was oh, the, it, uh, the Dr. Was it Spock. Dr. Spock? Yeah. And, uh, and it's, it's hard to imagine a parenting book coming along now that, uh, th th that would gain as wide acceptance as I understand that the Dr. Spock book gained in its time. Uh, and, and maybe, maybe uh, there's a distorting effect looking backwards and there was surely, you know, in impassioned argument at the time, but, uh, I, I don't know. We, we live, I think in a, in a more niche world, in a world where people are more comfortable, uh, buying into niches as well. And, uh, and where doing so is, uh, is celebrated. I think that, um, people who, people who announce in public that I am going about raising my child in this particular way that I've very carefully thought out and that, uh, you know, has these precepts and is part of this, uh, this subculture. Uh, you, you know, you get some pushback from other people who disagree, but you also, I think, uh, I, I think these people also get positive feedback uh, in that people think, oh, they've thought carefully about this. They're invested in it. They're spending a lot of time on it. Uh, that's the important thing. Yeah, I guess I'd have two things to say. Um, <clears throat> The first is it's a lot easier to pick up a book and be convinced that it's going to tell you how to parent um, than it is to think, I actually need to raise myself first before I can then mm -hmm. authentically adopt the responsibility of raising another person to be their own mm -hmm. human being. Um, that's a daunting task. Right. And, um, and it's so daunting that it seems like, how am I going to have time to do this? I'm already living my life. <laughs> Um, my feeling is, right. uh, you, I've, I'm, it's almost like a fate kind of thing where this is the hand that I've been dealt. Mm -hmm. This is just who I am. Um, I think there's a real incentive for people who feel that way, um, in part by choice, maybe in part because they're proud or whatever, maybe in part because they just feel like that's, that's reality. That that's just the way it is. I think there's a real incentive for them, mm -hmm. um, to feel like, Oh, but here's this book that will tell me. Um, regardless of who I am, if I just sort of adopt these 10 precepts or these five strategies or whatever it is, um, then at a minimum, I'm not going to fail as a parent. Uh, that's a powerful message. Right. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's interesting that these books that are coming out um, are not particularly scientific. Uh, certainly not in the way that people in the 50s thought of social science. Um, where right. there's a science, um, it applies to everyone because it's science, and uh, and that's not what's going on right now, I think, with parenting. I think what's going on with parenting now is it's kind of like, um, it's like ideologies uh, more than like science. Um, it's like master the credo of the tiger mom or whatever. I'm caricaturing, but lightly. Right. I'm not trying to be pejorative. I'm just trying to describe how this is working. Um, yeah. And so I think it's, it's curious that at a moment when supposedly science is on the upswing and where um, modern life creates conditions where people feel like they have to, if it's not science, then it's not true. And if it's not true, then who's to say? And if who's to say, then like it's not a guide for life. Um, at a moment when that's been the narrative about modernity and about science, we're sort of coming up against with child rearing an experience where people feel like, eh, no, there really is no science of child rearing. Um, I need some kind of creed. I need some like way of living, some art of life. Um, and that thirst for like uh, workable, workable art of living um, is a powerful one that science isn't going to, isn't going to quench. Um, it's easy to make fun of, you know, these books and this sort of art of life thing. And it's, you know, it's almost like treating child rearing as some, some like, uh, some variety of feng shui or something. It's easy to mock that, but I think it's right. important to note that this is a reaction against the idea that science can explain our lives for us and can run our lives for us. Um, I think it's a reaction well, well, to like to yeah. the spread of pharmaceuticals. It's a reaction to the idea that like, 
uh, the, are the life stages of someone who's growing up are going to fit into these predetermined categories um, and that like the science of your brain is is going to make your teenager behave in a certain way that's that's taking power away from people um, and I think that this explosion of interest in parenting books and in the, the mommy wars and arguing about how to parent um, reflects a desire to sort of re reclaim our destinies when we're parents um, I think people uh, sort of closer to our age than to our parents' generation um, are tending to feel like uh, their their unique personhood is kind of being taken away or challenged or threatened by parenthood sometimes. Um, that can be a disorienting feeling. Yeah, I think that that's... Uh, yeah. Well, and you and I are right on the cusp of the millennials, not quite millennial, and, uh, and yet not quite Generation X. And... Um, I wonder when I read about the millennials and I read, uh, you know, old pieces like David Brooks, the uh, the organization kid, and uh, when I read about millennials going into the workplace and and having a hard time transitioning from an academic experience where these goals are just set out in front of you uh, and transitioning to, uh, to to a work experience where uh, it, there is no obvious next milestone. Uh, I, I wonder how that generation, I wonder how people a little bit younger than us, how how uh, that personality trait, uh, or, or that generational trait rather, is going to map onto parenting and how it's going to change parenting for that generation. Uh, I, I suppose we'll see. I suppose it will. Uh, if there's one thing that seems to be holding true... Um, motorcycle. Um, <clears throat> there's a push or a drift toward having children later in life. Um, there's, been t there's been talk already um, about how increasingly uh, <clears throat> marriage and the legitimate uh, birth is increasingly an upper class um, or, or privileged person's life. Um, I think we're right. going to start hearing some conversations about how the poorer you are, the younger you have children. And the wealthier or more successful or more stable you are, uh, the longer you wait. <coughs> um, and that's going to have some interesting uh, generational impacts too. If we start to see like a real divide between uh, between people who are who are born to parents late in their parents' lives and people who are born to parents rather young in their parents' lives, uh, mm -hmm. especially uh, during a time culturally where. Um, where mat maturity and maturing is just happening later than it has in, in decades past. Well, um, why don't we why don't we skip ahead to the subject of advertising? Um, this is something else I wanted to talk about because Thomas Friedman wrote a column, and actually, I'm just going to read the beginning of it, which I think will be the easiest way to sum it up. He says, Pouring through Harvard philosopher Michael Sandel's new book, What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets, I found myself over and over again turning pages and saying, I had no idea. I had no idea that in the year 2000, as Sandel notes, a Russian rocket emblazoned with a giant Pizza Hut logo carried advertising into outer space. Or that in 2001, the British novelist Faye Weldon wrote a book commissioned by the jewelry company Bulgaria and that in exchange for payment, the author agreed to mention Bulgari jewelry in the novel at least a dozen times. I knew that stadiums are now named for corporations, but had no idea that now even sliding into home is a corporate-sponsored event, writes Sandel. New York Life Insurance Company has a deal with 10 Major League Baseball teams that triggers a promotional plug every time a player slides safely into base. When the umpire calls the runner safe at home plate, a corporate logo appears on the television screen, and the play-by-play -play announcer must say, safe at home, safe and secure, New York Life. And while I knew that retired baseball players sell their autographs for $15 a pop, I had no idea that Pete Rose, who was banished from baseball for life for betting, has a website that, Sandel writes, sells memorabilia related to his banishment. For $299 plus shipping and handling, you can buy a baseball autographed by Rose and inscribed with an apology. I'm sorry I bet on baseball. For $500, Rose will send you an autographed copy of the document banishing him from the game. And he goes on and talks about... Um, a New Jersey public school that sold naming rights to its gym, and he talks about uh, people being able to bypass the normal TSA security line if they're wealthy travelers and they have gone through a certain process. 
Um, and, and then he gets to his uh, point, which is, seen in isolation, these commercial encroachments seem innocuous enough. But Sandal sees them as signs of a bad trend. Over the last three decades, he states, we've drifted from having a market economy to becoming a market society. A market economy is a tool, a valuable and effective tool for organizing productive activity. But a market society is a place where everything is up for sale. It's a way of life where market values govern every sphere of life. Why worry about this trend? Because, Sandal argues, market values are crowding out civic practices. When public schools are plastered with commercial advertising, they teach students to be consumers rather than citizens. When we outsource war to private military contractors, and when we have separate shorter lines for airport security for those that can afford them, the result is that the affluent and those of modest means live in increasingly separate lives, and the class-mixing institutions and public spaces that forge a sense of common experience and shared citizenship get eroded. So there's a little bit of Charles Murray in there. There's a little bit of Mickey Kaus's The End of Equality in there, this concern for social equality and a concern that people in different income groups, uh, that it's important for them to interact. Uh, and, and I'm pretty much on board with Friedman there, I think. Um, but what I think is really weird about this column is conflating advertising with those things. Uh, I, I guess the most succinct way to put it is the column's title is uh, something like, this column is sponsored by no one. Uh, but, of course, it appears on the New York Times website, and there's a banner ad for a credit card above it. And precisely because it is sponsored by someone, uh, anyone of any income level can read it for free on the web. Um, and, and I guess the argument that I want to make, and, and I'm curious what you think about it, is that uh, whatever you think about advertising, e even if you think advertising is terrible in some uh, Don DeLillo-esque way, um, it is nevertheless the fact that advertising makes America a more egalitarian place than it would be otherwise, because it subsidizes all of this free stuff. Uh, it subsidizes all of these shared experiences from professional sports to the newspapers that we have, to the television networks that we have, to the free web-based email accounts that we use. And to me, if you took away advertising, uh, America would be a lot less equal of a place. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, on on the journalism front, I'm a little concerned that the advertising model is like a charade. Um, it, does it really work? I, are people really buying things that are being advertised on their sort of in their in their Gmail? You know, what am I looking at right now? Uh, Scott Trade on my Gmail. Am I really gonna like? go use Scott Trade after we're done taping this? No, I'm, I'm certainly not. Um, whenever I like pick up a, a copy of you know Vanity Fair and flip through it, am I, do I then go buy anything I see in that magazine? No, I don't. Um, you know, if I had the money to buy it, like the, you know, the, the Bulgari uh, watch or whatever, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe I would. Uh, but I'm, I'm not persuaded that the advertising model is, is viable. Um, obviously there's, there's always been advertising. Um, but the bigger picture is, uh, is, is like you said, a culture where everything's for sale, where everything's not only, uh, being sold, but is, is being purchased too. Um, that used to trouble me, uh, more than it does. Um, and mm -hmm. I think, I think ultimately the onus is on the individual to, understand why they're selling what they're selling um, what of their what of their self it is that they're selling um, and some of these decisions about what kind of profession to go into what kind of career to have um, how much to you know quote unquote buy into consumerism um, a lot of that stuff is is I think emanates from highly personal decisions about like what sacrifices to make in your life and like just negotiating um, an acceptable life for yourself. Um, I realize I'm speaking a, a bit abstractly, uh, but um, but I think it's really hard to speak in general terms about what in particular is wrong with a society where um, you know you go see a baseball game and, and you get pitched on life insurance when someone slides into home plate. What's the harm that's taking place there? Um, or if it's not a harm, 
uh, what's, the, what's the good that's being crowded out? Um, it's easy to say in a particular instance, well, we could have this unadulterated sports experience uh, if it wasn't for this advertisement. Um, but I doubt that that's what Sandal is driving at. Um, I think what he's driving at is, um, is that the commercialization of, public, of all public space uh, causes people to stop thinking about who they really are. Um, that's a legitimate concern. Uh, but it's the kind of concern that I don't think is going to be addressed by, you know, by more regulation or sort of banning these things or restricting where advertisements appear. Uh, that's not going to get to the root of the problem. Uh, the root of the problem is people have a, an affirmative desire to be distracted from thinking about who they really are. Um, so you know, in, in years past, they well, I think, you know, they've, I they've think indulged that by by you know by by participating in violent nationalism um, instead of by buying stuff. Right. But I mean, I guess uh, my big picture problem with the Friedman column, and I don't know if I would have the same problem with Sandal's book if it's correctly characterized in the column or not. But my bigger problem is conflating all of these different kinds of commercialization as if they're problematic for the same reason, right? So, so you can imagine a system where, uh, and, and in fact, we've had a system at times where you could buy your way out of a draft, and uh, and it's you know I think that we've come to consensus in society, or or as close to it as you ever get, that 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 would be very problematic. Uh, it it would be problematic for completely different reasons than putting advertising on the back of the seats in a school bus, and. It, you know, maybe they're both problematic. I I would be against both of those things. Uh, you could categorize them both as the commercialization of public life, but but they'd be wrong for very different reasons. And uh, I think teasing apart those reasons is important, uh, precisely because um, the advertising on the back of the school bus seat, you know, is is presumably helping to pay for a public good. And if you go another step and you talk about the advertising in the baseball stadium, it doesn't seem to me problematic in the same way as advertising on the back of a school bus seat. Uh, in, in other words, it seems to have less of a cost. Uh, and, it, and it seems to have this benefit of helping this you know, quasi-public space be more egalitarian than it otherwise would. Uh, because get rid of all the advertising and suddenly the costs are borne by the ticket holders and the seats go up. Uh, or maybe professional sports as an industry collapses, and we don't. There's one more thing that we don't have that's shared among people of all income levels. Um, so yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think Friedman's analysis is uh, is pretty lazy. I don't. I wouldn't say the same about Sandals just because I'd want to read his book before I made such a claim. Right, right. Uh, when when I think about sort of the the, the commercialization um, critique that says this is increasing inequality in some way. Um, I'm reminded of, uh, of Tocqueville's dictum that, that said more or less, um, <clears throat> it's, not, it's not really the wealth that, that the less fortunate begrudge of the wealthy. <coughs> it's not their wealth so much as their pride. Uh, and I think that's really astute. Um, and I think we see that right now in, in government or in, in politics, where why has, why has the president advanced the Buffett rule. Why does he want to push that? Not for any economic reason. Not really. I, I think the administration has conceded that you know, this is not really going to move the needle on the budget. Uh, it's not going to move the needle on the deficit. Um, it's there as a moral pitch, which is um, the wealthy need to be humbled a little bit um, or, else, mm -hmm. or else people are going to be mad about it um, because it chafes against our democratic sense of equality. Um, to see people who are just like us, more or less in every way, except they have a pile more money. Um, yeah, typically um, in America, you have to actually be better at stuff to get more money. Um, there is still a, a pretty good correlation between talent and, and wealth, or competence and wealth, merit and money. Um, but it's also true that fortunes rise and fall very fast in America. Um, it's not like old style aristocratic countries where, um, where wealth was accumulated over generations. And I'm not talking like two or three generations, you know, I'm talking about like five to 10 maybe generations. 
uh, a long time. Right, yeah. <clears throat> um, it's not the way it is here. Um, we seem to intuit as Americans, I think, uh, that um, that it's 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 easier here than it has been maybe in, in human history uh, to get rich um, and and to feel more more whatever more worthy than people who aren't rich um, and that that kind of sensation is something that we're particularly uh, vulnerable to as as more or less interchangeable human beings. Um, so it's not surprising right. that we would want to curb that or hedge against uh, hedge against it in politics. Of course, you know, for people on the right of center, they're no, no, this is terrible. Like, let to celebrate those people. They're the achievers. They're an inspiration to us all. Um, Tocqueville's reminder would be: in a democratic society like ours, where the equality of conditions is really what defines us. You know, Tocqueville would say, increasing inequality. You, you know, maybe there are like more super super rich people, but mostly. Americans are more like each other now than they have been in the past. Um, that phenomenon, uh, in Tocqueville's estimation, um, is is going to keep Americans wanting to humble the wealthy um, even more than they want to. You know, it's 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 not so much they want to take their money away; it's that they don't want them feeling like they're a new aristocracy. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't we close things out by talking about? the business of becoming a rock star. Um, you have, it, it, you w previously lived in LA and were the front man in a band. And since you returned to LA, you started up uh, in, in music again and play with a band called Black Highlighter. And I, we can link page where I, I believe people can stream the album online. Is that right? Uh, yeah, you can find uh, you can find Black Highlighter on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. Uh, there's a site called TuneCore um, where you can hear some stuff too. Uh, but there's this site called SoundCloud, which if you haven't checked it out, you should. Um, it's a great place to find new music, and it's also a great place to just listen to music. Uh, and it's basically what it what it says it is. It's it's the cloud. It's a cloud um, of music. Uh, so we uploaded our stuff there, and, and that's how. It, how Facebook does it is you can get to bands' music on their band page portion of their Facebook profile, um, and it's all hosted at, at SoundCloud. So yeah, there are a lot of different ways to do it. Oh, and of course Spotify. Um, you can always go on Spotify and, and stream the songs as well. Yeah, so, and so so what I'm curious about uh, a, a couple of things. You um, you did this some years ago, and you're doing it now. You were uh, a, a different age then. Technology was different then. The way that bands publicized themselves was different. Uh, maybe you should pick out the most interesting thing in all that. Uh, how, how is it different between now and then? What's the most? What are the interesting ways in which uh, it is different to try and make it as a viable rock band? Uh, there are huge differences. Um, the the funniest one I think <clears throat> is you know back in two thousand three when I was doing this the first time around. Um, there was still a Tower Records on Sunset Boulevard. Uh, there was still, mm -hmm. I think, such a thing as a Virgin Megastore. Um, now, it's like, you know, how much money can you get for selling a CD? Uh, not a lot. Um, vinyl record stores, on the other hand, um, I was down at a place called Permanent Records, ha ha, down in, in uh, my neighborhood, <clears throat> meeting the, the owner, vinyl record shop, um, and she said, you know, sales are up 250% over last year. Um, and she just doesn't stock CDs wow. because nobody wants them. Right. Um, it's either a download or it's vinyl. And if you're going to bother listening to something physical, um, I don't think it's just a quirk of hipsterism to say, I'd like to have a large physical object with like a nice big cover image and something I can pull out of a sleeve and something I can, you know, there's a tactile ritual that's involved in listening to music on vinyl. Um, and I don't think it's, uh, fair to music or to um, the antiquated technology of vinyl uh, to say that people would just do this because they're sort of putting one over on themselves and making themselves feel like some kind of uh, retro sophisticate. Uh, you know, there is something. Yeah, well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't just think it's tactile. I mean, I, I did a blogging hands a while ago with uh, my friend Alex Schmidt, who was talking about the ways in which she has changed her music consumption. Uh, due to listening to it on an iPod. And basically that uh, one thing that she doesn't like about it is that she 
uh, she less frequently takes the time to listen to a whole album because it's so easy to skip between songs. And that uh, in the days when she was listening to things on CDs, one thing that would happen is that she would start out liking, you know, maybe the single that cost her to buy the album, but then uh, a, a little bit later it would be a, a different song that was her favorite, and a little bit after that a song that she hadn't even liked in the beginning uh, turned out to be her favorite. And I think even more than CDs, vinyl allows you, uh, it, it's almost like a little bit of a nudge to l listen to whole albums because it's very hard to skip songs. And if, if you're the kind of person who consumes music that way, I am the kind of person who uh, finds that I like different songs over time, but, but I don't always have the willpower to listen to whole albums when I have it on my iPod. Vinyl seems like a good way to go. Yeah, I think that's right, and I think it speaks to something bigger <clears throat> about how music is changing as well. Uh, in, in Vice magazine, uh, <clears throat> a couple issues ago, um, there was a story in there about how it's sort of the end of dreams for, for young people who want to become rock stars. Uh, the, the music landscape has changed so much that <clears throat> that now, you know, you, you're really not going to be the next Journey, you know, or the next Nirvana. It's pretty much not going to happen for you. Um, and how it's this kind of purgation for young kids to be schlepping around in their vans, um, trying to become rock stars, touring, um, while the industry is being, you know, pulled out from beneath them. Um, it was very depressing, um, and it was a nice kind of head check. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, I think that you're getting a lot more people making music nowadays who are doing it because they, because it's coming from somewhere in their soul that is like life affirming for them. Um, life affirming mm -hmm. because they want to give their music to people as like a gift, as a gratuity. Um, that's kind of cute in a, in a, oh, this is about more than capitalism sort of way. That's, I'm less interested in, in the sociology of it than I am like in, on a personal basis. Um, is the number of musicians increasing where the musician, the individual, um, is, is doing music because they feel like they have to uh, for their own purposes, mm -hmm. um, not because they, they have some delusion of grandeur or because they're, they're trying to like take advantage of a, of a, a market opportunity. Um, and I think that's really good for music, um, even if it's not, you know, even if it's not great for the bottom line um, of, of record companies. But record companies, you know, record companies aren't the, the music industry. Um, I don't think the music industry is going anywhere anytime soon. I think that people are always going to listen to music. And I think that people are, are always going to um, pay money to experience uh, music in a way that truly moves them. Uh, and, and, and I would think to to support music that they like, even if they don't have to. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and yeah, at the margins, it's like, okay, uh, it's easy to get music that you don't pay for. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's easy to only let people listen to music uh, for free. Um, and I think that we're sort of probably headed in a direction where it's like... <laughs> Uh, where it's kind of like yeah, everyone has their own radio, so I can you know I can let everyone hear my music as much as they want. But if they want to own the music, then I I think I can pretty much exercise enough control so that they have to buy it. Um, if you get super huge right. and then like you get pirated on some kind of massive scale, then okay, yeah, that's that's too bad. Um, but if that's happening to you, then. <laughs> then you should probably be thankful that you're even in that position to begin with. Right. Uh, well, l l why, don't we, uh, why don't we close by telling us uh, w what song should people go listen to after they close this Blogging Heads window? Um, if you like uh, sort of like, uh, like the hives or the strokes or like something very straight ahead and loud, um, Blonde Beasts of Prey is a song that's a good place to start. Um, Scarlet Fever is another one that's, that's in that pocket. Um, if you like, uh, it's kind of like more sonically adventurous the further into the record you go. So the second half of the record is, yeah. is kind of like more of a, a, a sonical, sonic suite or sonic feast. Um, and the first half of the record is very, uh, punchy and, and single-ish. 
Um, so if you if you want to sort of you know sit back with the beverage of your choice and put on some headphones and, and space out for a while, um, go with the second half of the record. Um, and if you want to like jump up and down and, and listen to something loud, uh, go with the first mm -hmm. half. All right. Well, thanks for talking, James. Enjoyable as always. I hope we do it again soon. Thanks, Connor. Cheers.